As we continue in this treatise entitled Fatwa al Hamawiyya al Kubra by the great Imam Taqi al Din Ahmed ibn Abdul Hadeen ibn Abdul Salam ibn Taymiyyah al Hawrani al Dimishqi al Numayri, the one who died 728 and who was the son of the man who was the son of the man who was the son of the man who was the son of the man. The time now is 7.13 p.m. Wednesday, June the 20... Excuse me, January. Sorry, I'm going to glasses. January the 20... What is it? 25th or 29th? 25th. With the time now that we said is 7.13 p.m., which agrees now on the Hijri calendar, which is the 4th of Rajah. Technically, it's Thursday evening. The year Alf Arba'amiya 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 1444 after the migration of our Prophet alayhi salatu salam. As we continue in this treatise, where we were discussing the athar of the salaf in regards to one following their desires in the Fibab al-Aqidah the affair of creed or belief was binding upon every Muslim to hold on to the creed of these great individuals who Shaykh al-Islam has conveyed their statements. And he continues to continue, or excuse me, he continues to elaborate on these great transmissions and reports from these the ulama who are considered the awliya of Allah bi ibn as the true awliya of Allah who are the people of the sunnah especially these individuals who we have mentioned. We have mentioned their names, and it's binding upon a Muslim to know these great scholars because Allah made them one of the reasons of why this religion was protected and why it remained in a pure state, in a pure form, as it is, as it is in today. From these great athar, from these great individuals, these great men who lived, and they died, and they struggled, and they sacrificed themselves and everything, in order to establish the truth and in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion to be victorious and the utmost in the earth for the kalimah of Allah or the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the utmost or superior in the lands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless these men to be the, one of the reasons in front of them as we continue is the great Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi who is also from the great Imam the great Imam of the Sunnah and the Salaf Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, Rahimallah, and the Albani. <coughs> As you'll find that he's from the Al Hufaf, the great memorizers, and the Mutqini, those who are known to be astute and accurate in their reports, meaning in what they conveyed upon the Prophet. They were known for great precision and accuracy. And he was from those of piety in our religion who memorized and they sacrificed and they took advantage of their time in collecting and memorizing and understanding and writing, writing treaties and conveying hadith in order for the religion to be preserved and to be widespread so that people can attain this proper guidance. So this great Imam, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, Rahimallah al Anbali, whose kunya was Abu Sa'id, <coughs> Abu Sa'id al Anbali. This great Imam, who Shaykh al Islam conveyed his kalam. Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, that he goes on to say, conveyed his statement, Abdul Rahman ibn Bahdi, Allahu qal, laysa fi ashab al ahwa'i, sharun min ashab jahmin, yadurun, ala ay yatulu, laysa fi sama ishi, Allah, wallahi, Allah, yunakahu, wala yuarrathu. <clears throat> You'll find that he says, he says, there's not amongst the people of desires. People are more evil than the companions of Jahm, Jahm ibn Safwan. 
He said that they hover around by saying, there's nothing or there isn't anything in the heavens. There isn't anything in the heavens. Laysa fi samaish. There is nothing in the heavens. He says, I see, and I swear by Allah, that they are not married off, meaning to the Muslims. I see that they are not to be married off. And nor are they what? To be inherited or to receive inheritance. As you'll find that the great Imam <coughs> Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, due to the fact that you'll find that those who deviated in the creed of those who are upon the truth, and that it became widespread, and many people became affected by this type of perverted ideologies or corrupt beliefs. <coughs> So you'll find even the great Imam Muhammad Amman al-Jari rahimahullah that he said this regarding by saying مَنْ هُنَا يَتَّضِحُ لَكُمْ أَنَّ عِلْمَ الْكَلَامِ غَيْرُ التَّوْحِيدِ وَغَيْرُ الْعَقِيدَةِ إِطْلَاقُ التَّوْحِيدِ وَإِطْلَاقُ الْعَقِيدَةِ عَلَى عِلْمَ الْكَلَامِ وَعَلَى مَا تَدْرُسُهُ الْإِشْعَلِيَةِ He says for the reader and those who are listening and learning has become clear to you that the knowledge of rhetoric and when we say so-called speculative knowledge of rhetoric, meaning the knowledge of philosophy or Greek philosophy and the Greek ilm al of philosophy and logic. Of all those types of knowledge that were inherited from Greek philosophy that was extracted from their knowledge, in which you'll find that in the time of the past, they called it ilm al-kalam. Ilm al-kalam. Ilm al-kalam, meaning knowledge of rhetoric, meaning the knowledge that was extracted from philosophy and logic, taking it from the Greeks and incorporating it in Islam. That type of knowledge, everyone, was called ilm al-kalam. He says, ilm al-kalam is the great Imam Muhammad Amal al-Jami. He says, rahimahullah, he's, you'll find that he says, that this type of usage, meaning the word Tawheed, should not be applied to Ilm al-Kalam. Or Ilm al-Kalam is not Tawheed, nor is it the correct Aqeedah. Even though you'll find some of the Muslims saying that, but that's not correct. Itlaq al-Tawheed wa itlaq al-Aqeedah ala Ilm al-Kalam, the usage of the word Tawheed, or Islamic monotheism, or the usage of the word aqidah, which means belief, upon so-called ilm al-kalam, and upon what the isha'ariyah studies. And you'll find to this day, they try to deceive the masses by, by this type of deception. By what they study, not realizing, like we mentioned, that all of this has been extracted from Greek philosophy and logic. You'll find that in order for them to attain followers, or gather the masses, they have to call it what? Tawheed. They have to call it what? Aqidah. In order to deceive them, so they can what? So can, can now, so-called bring them in, thinking in, in the Muslim's mind that he's about to re receive something of the truth to educate themselves and find out that it's what? It's just unadulterated, if you want to say, clear, absolute poison. In order to what? Distort their knowledge and distort their what? Their belief. And as a result of it, they go astray. You'll find that even the great Imam Sheikh Salih Fuzan, Hafizullah, that he mentioned and said that the mere fact that Muslims come to the religion upon these type of people is as if they're leaving off kufr and embracing another type of what? Another type of pollutants, which is extremely dangerous. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you away from disbelief in order, in certain aspects, to learn some type of disbelief, which is extremely what? Dangerous. How can the fact that you leave off his Kufr, the affairs of disbelief, all to what embrace another type of disbelief, meaning worshiping of, of human beings. So as if you left off the worship of human beings in order to what? Embrace belief of what? Human beings. What do I mean by that? Such as you'll find from the devious sects of the Sufiya, who are deeply engrossed in it, calling to what everyone? The worship of the dead and worship of the graves. 
So a person abandons Islam to leave off a, one, a, a type of kufr rather than the greatest form of kufr in order to what? Come into Islam and embrace another type of kufr. Because worshiping of graves is what everyone? It's kufr. Worshiping of graves and worshiping of the dead and worshiping of, 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 the, of ghosts and devils and all these other affairs is kufr. It's belief, all these type of perverted ideologies will nullify one's Islam. So people embracing Islam upon the method of these type of people is extremely dangerous. You embrace Islam, learning ilm al kalam and as a result of it, you'll find that the majority of those who come into the religion by the way of these people, they end up either what? Becoming extremely weak in their religion with some type of doubt within their creed or they abandon Islam altogether. Why? Because they were never given something or taught something that would give them what? Surety. And give them the opinion and give them nutrients to their, to their soul and to their heart by instilling in it the nutrients of knowing what they're upon is the truth, which is knowledge, meaning proper knowledge. That will what? For, for sure, cut all the doubt and it will build them upon a stable foundation. So, when the winds come to blow, the violent currents, and when I mean the violent currents, meaning the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send to that person's or to that individual's way. Because every person that embraces Islam will, is, will be tested. There's not an individual that will come to Salafiyah except you will be tested. In some, some type of shape, form, or fashion. You will be tested. You'll be tested in your what? Either through your family, or through your children, or through the people who say they are with you. Allah might test you through them. There's so many ways you'll be tested. You can be tested by the masjid, improper treatment from some of your own people. This happens. Does it happen, everyone? Yes, absolutely. You can even be proud that Allah might test you through your own Salafi brothers and sisters that will talk about you and they will avoid you and some of them might even abandon you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you in a way, in a manner that will hurt the most to see if you will be what? Firm. So when those type of violent currents come, everyone, what will be the thing that will keep you stable except what? Your aqidah, your belief. And if that's tainted, then what do you resort to? What will be your fortification? What will be your protection? What will be, what will be your shield? Is it clear, everyone? So these are the affairs that you'll find that the a'imma were doing their best, rather putting forth their utmost effort in preserving in order for the people to maintain their belief in case when the test comes, they will have their protection. And their protection, like we said, is their belief. But can you imagine now, someone learning this type of, of, of knowledge that already causes instability from the beginning. And then the test comes and they have to rely on something unstable in order for what? To be protected? What do you think will happen? And that's the reason why the majority of the people that come by the method of these type of individuals, meaning those Muslims that are upon the deviant creed, you'll find, like we said, they either become extremely weak and their religion, or they're Muslim by name, with an actuality hiding some type of doubt within themselves. Or, like we said, they just abandon Islam altogether and they embrace something else. Why? Because they were never taught proper knowledge which will allow them to attain the aim, surety, and stability in a religion. So when those times happen, they'll be able to be remain firm and steadfast. Is it clear, everyone? So, the affairs of the ilm al kalam should not be called Tawheed or Aqidah at all. The Greek Imam says, Kullu dhalika khata. All that is wrong. The ilm al kalam shay, wa la aqidah tu wa tawheed u shayun akha, la yajtabi'ah. He says, Kullu dhalika khata. All that is wrong. The knowledge of what? Of speech is one thing, the knowledge of rhetoric is one thing. And true aqidah and tawheed is something else. They can never merge together. Is it clear, everyone? Right, so let's keep going. Let's explain what the great Imam goes on to say. Laysafi ashab al ahla. Meaning, there's nothing amongst the people of desire. So who is he speaking about? Who we're speaking about now? People of Kalam, ulama al Kalam. <coughs> and they're different groups. <coughs> Excuse me, everyone. Excuse me. He said, 
There is no one amongst the people of Kalam. We just explained the meaning of, of, of Ilm al Kalam or Ulama al Kalam. People who are evil more than the companions of Jahan. <coughs> meaning the companions of Jahan and those who are what? On a lesser level, even though they have been affected by his belief. Who is speaking about, for example, the Mu'tazila? They're still considered people of what? Kalam. Even though they did not reach the level of Jahl al Safwan or the Jahmiya or the Asha'ira or the Matulidiyah. So they're on lower levels, even though the highest of them, as far as misguidance, are the Jahmiya. But they now, you'll find that they go under in levels. Who are what? The Jahmiya. Then who comes after that? The Mu'tazila. Who comes after that? The Asha'ira. And who comes after that, for example, even though the Matulidiyah is. Consider it almost the same. It's the Asha'ira. Okay. Yadurun ala ayyatulu. Laysa fi sabai shay. He says all of them hover around by saying there is nothing in the heavens. <clears throat> You'll find that we regretfully say, as the great Imam goes on to say, دَخَلَتْ هَذِي الْعَقِيدَةُ عَلَى الْإِشَعْرِيَةِ الْآن. He says you'll find that we, we regretfully say that this belief has so-called and Entered upon the so called group called the Isha'iyyah today, right now. He says, and what's now been considered a muqarrab, what has now been established or solidified within their books as a curriculum, this type of meaning. What meaning? For example, there's a book that they entitled called Aqidah to Salusiyah, where that book is the so called Kitab al Muqaddas That's considered the what? The venerated so called praiseworthy book. That all of them oblige upon their followers to what? Memorize. That they have to memorize it or else they would be considered misguided. So in that book, you'll find that that is the most glorious so-called book with them. Whether you'll find that the little ones or the young are commanded. Rather, it's a priority for them to memorize it. And the youth are commanded to also what? Memorize it. Similar to how one would memorize Surah Al-Fatiha. You will have to memorize what? The metan or the text of this book called As-Salusiya. So keep in mind, this is also the story of Prophet Ibrahim in which we'll talk about in another time or another occasion when we have a little bit more time to give a little more details in this regard because it will blow your mind. For this book called Book As-Salusiya, which is like we said, Al-Risalat Al-Mahfudah al marufa That book that is memorized and is known with this deviant sect called the Asha'ira today is still memorized. Now listen to what they say. This is what the little children memorize. Listen everyone. This is worse than LGBTQ. What I'm about to say. The little children memorize this while they're young and the teenagers and the youth memorize this statement. This is what they say. Allah is not above the throne. Nor is he under it, nor is he at the right of it, nor is he to the left of it. Is it clear, everyone? This is worse than LGBTQ. This type of what? Statement. Why? This is adulterated deviation in one's creed. Is it clear? Rather, all of the atrocities start with this type of deviation. Everything else falls into place. Once a person deviates in a belief, all of the filthy acts are be become easy to what and acceptable to do with no reluctancy. So this right here is deviation in one's creed, which that is worse than what LGBTQ. Why? Because LGBTQ, everyone, is ma'asi, is major sins. As long as they do not marry. If you marry, that is now making it halal, that will nullify your sin. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? I'll say it again. This type of deviation is worse than LGBTQ. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Why? LGBTQ is what? Ma'asi. That's major sins. Even though that's not easy either. We still consider kaba'ir. Major sins. As long as they know what? Make it halal. The problem is if you marry. 
When you marry, that's a form of what? Making it halal. That's the reason why when a person marries, that's extremely dangerous. Why? Because now you're making the affair halal. It was more ahwan. It was more of a less level that you fought. If, if Allah tested you with that in your faith, that you would do it without anyone knowing. Then you now openly broadcast by saying, I'm going to marry someone. I don't care who witnesses it. Which affair is more, relatively speaking, which affair is more worse? Huh? The one who goes to set out the what? Write a marriage contract. And then put it online and say, everyone come. And let's all celebrate. Those affairs now, what are you doing, everyone? Let's consider what? Making it what, everyone? Halal. The affair of what a person does if they hide the sin, even though it's considered still major. However, that's relatively speaking, more what? More of what a person can deem for that person to now. It shows that the person in their peanut that, that they're still what? I'm still feel like I'm wrong. I know I shouldn't do this, even though I'm going to be tested. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me tawfiq so I can abandon this act. When a person does it behind closed doors, it still shows they have some type of what? Shame. They have some shame in what they're doing. They have some shyness. They still have some fear of Allah. That I know I should be doing it. I'm, I'm struggling with myself. But may Allah aid me and help me to get over the sickness. However, now when you go on social media platforms, invitations, marriage contracts, all those other affairs, what does that now become, everyone? Now we can have that. However, the origin of these affairs of homosexuality and all these other matters that the, this society is being tested with today is still considered what everyone major sins in its origin. However, this affair of saying Allah is not above and that Allah is not under the throne, nor above the throne, nor to the right of it, nor to the left of it, this is worse. And this is more beloved to the devil than mere LGBTQ. Is it clear, everyone? Unless the person does not make it halal. That's what we want to clarify because I've seen this type of ignorance become a widespread amongst the Muslims. This is worse, brothers and sisters. Why? Because this is the statements of what? Atheism. When a person says Allah is not above the throne. Now keep in mind there are Muslims who are upon deviant sex that memorize this and they command their children to memorize it. Not realizing that these children are memorizing statements of atheism. And is put in their books, and the books that are so-called glorified, revered, and respected with the Muslims, that they commanded their children from the time they're young to memorize statements of atheism. Which is worse? What statements are they memorizing of atheism, everyone? This statement here. Allah is not above the throne. He's not under the throne, nor is he to the left, nor is he to the right. If you were to ask an individual, give me an accurate description of something that does not exist, whoop, how would you say it? It's not above, it's not under, it's not what? It's not to the right, nor is it what? Non-existence. Non-existence of Allah, which is what? Atheism. Atheism. Is it clear, everyone? Can you imagine that there are Muslims out there that say, La ilaha illallah, coming with affairs is considered an oxymoron. Affairs where you are submitting to Allah, hence at the same time you are uttering out of your mouth, negating His existence. Is it clear, everyone? Gee. So, this type of ibadah, as we said, is the ibadah to Jahmiyyah. This is the statements of the Jahmiyyah. Saying Allah is not above the throne, nor is He under the throne, nor to the right, to the left. This statement right here is worse. Did LGBTQ in its origin? Why everyone is deviation in creed, which is the worst form. Rather, this type of affair is more beloved to the devil than these filthy acts that are despicable, no doubt, and is also in its origin. But everything has to be put in its perspective, everyone, where we do not utilize our emotions to get in the way. You might feel one type or feel some type of way. Oh, a man having to be intimate with another bull, that's just repugnantly disgusting. Yeah, in regards 
to what's considered major sins? Absolutely. But when the affairs is considered deviation of creed and used to tell Muslims these type of statements, you don't find any reaction whatsoever. You'll say Allah saying Allah is not above. The Muslim will be like, ah, that's cool. What's wrong with that? When the affair is supposed to be what? Equally repulsive and not more when you hear these type of statements. To have repulsion within yourself and disgust that a person will utter these type of statements out of their mouth is more deserving when the type of statement is made about Allah not being above than you hearing about another man being desirable for another man. Is it clear, everyone? Fine. So like we mentioned and said, these are the statements in which you'll find that those who've been affected by Greek philosophy and from them is the Muslims who embark upon the belief of the Asha'ira. This is what they what? Mention. So do not be uh, amazed that when we mention the deviant sects who have fell into these type of great atrocities, from them is the mentioning of the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiya. Well, you'll find that there are Muslims out there who will say, oh, all you guys are just uncovering up the dead. Why are you speaking about something that transpired where it doesn't affect us today? As they say, لا يقولوا نحن ننبش القبور ونتكلم عن الموتى الذين قد مضت عليه القرون He said, you guys are just uncovering and digging up the graves. So you're speaking about the dead, which centuries have passed by. There's no need to speak about that. However, we speak about a belief that is present and widespread in books and amongst the Muslims today. And it's not a prerequisite or it's important that the so-called Ashab al that those people who are upon that way in the past that they're present today. That's not a prerequisite. Meaning, the prerequisite is in order to teach the Muslims the danger of it is just the mere fact that the presence of that belief is what? Is here or amongst us or widespread. That's the reason why we teach the people, enlighten them and educate them so they can what? Be on guard against it and protect themselves from it and protect the other Muslims from it and to realize the dangers of it and in order to let one know how beautiful the Aqidah of Salafiyah is so it can be distinct for what's considered condemned and filthy. And that affair only takes place when you mention both and you teach the people what is the haq and you teaching them at the same time the Baal so they can stay away from it and then by you teaching them both affairs it becomes clear and distinct and the uglified and the beautified become what? Clear also. And that's where you'll come in the poetry where it says He says in the poetry he says the opposite what reveals the beauty of it is its opposite. And by opposites, things become clear and distinct. So when you hear affairs of what's the beautiful creed of the of Aqidah to Sunnah, we also bring the falsehood in order for the people to be enlightened by it, so those affairs can be what? Clear and distinct to them in order for them to avoid it. Is it clear, everyone? Jamie. This type of Aqidah is present. However, you'll find that it's studied other than the name of the Jahmiyyah. They utilize other names. So it's not use the word Jahmiya in order for people to so-called, once they hear it, they'll flee away from it. However, the same thing or the same reality is one, even though they might have changed the name. It's not a, just a mere fact that a person now comes with another name. If it's the same thing, it's the same thing. It is what it is. Even though a person might have changed the name and put a new title on it or say that's another group or rather that's not the Jahmiya. Rather, this is so-and-so. Or they'll try to use some other type of title to put on it in order to hide it. But the reality is, it's still what it is. A person comes with a bottle of, al of alcohol and they put on the title Refreshing Drink. Does it change, change the reality of the contents of what it is? No. So you'll find people might say, this is scotch. No, they take the title and they'll put around it Refreshing Drink. Beneficial Refreshing Drink. Just the mere change of the title, does it change the contents of what's inside the Bible? bottle? No. That's what we're saying here. Is it clear, everyone? Just because this Aqidah has now been put on another title, some of them might try to say, no, that's Aqidah. Some of them will try to say, no, it's Tawheed. Or some of them will try to say, no, this is true Islam, or whatever they might use as a title. 
in order to deceive and beguile, mislead the masses, the reality is it's still the same as guidance. And just the mere fact, as they say, تَغِيرُ الْإِسْمَى لَا تُغَيِّرُ الْحَقَائِقِ Changing the names do not change the what? The reality of what it is. Is it clear, everyone? طيب هذا العبارة هي عبارة جهنية دخلت عند الأشاعرة This statement, as they said, Allah not being above the throne or under the throne or to the right of the throne or to the left had entered upon the Ashaira and it polluted their belief. And you'll find that the لا يزال كثير من من شبابنا الصغار الذين لا يفرقون بين التمرة والجبرة لا يزالون يدرسون هذه العقيدة إلى يومنا هذا. يقولون ليس في السماء شيء. He says you'll find in which our young youth or our young ones are do not distinguish between the tamra and the jamra. <laughs> what's the tamra and the jamra? They don't distinguish between what's a date and what's considered a haqqo. He says you'll find that they'll continue to study this disbelief to this day of ours. And they'll say to this very day, some of them, there's nothing above the heavens. Statements of atheism. Even though they say they submitted to Allah. And they say, La ilaha illallah. And that's the meaning of the statement of the great Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi. Let's go to the last statement, everyone. The Shaykh Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, the great Imam, he goes on to say, Allah, wallahi, an la yunakahu, wa la yuwarrafu. He says, I see, I swear by Allah, they are not married off. La yunakahu. They are not married off. Nor do they receive any inheritance. They are not given inheritance or they are not inherited from. Indeed, they are disbelievers. Now listen to this. Let's explain this statement here. This is the what the majority of the people, the Sunnah in the past that were upon. That the Jahmiyyah were what everyone? Kuffar. Generally. That you'll find that the A'yan, especially the callers, the cause from amongst them were considered kuffar. Is it clear, everyone? The callers from amongst them. Why, everyone? Because they're people of knowledge. The callers and those who call to it and write books, they're the so-called one who has proper knowledge about it. They were deemed to be what? Kuffar. This is the, what the great Imam Muhammad Imam Jami says. Kuntu a'taqidu anna hadha ijma'a. I used to have the firm belief that this was a consensus, meaning this was an agreement. He says, He said, however, it became clear that some of the people of knowledge, they did not, or they were not frank of declaring them to be kuffar, all of them. No. He said, however, however, the majority of the salaf and those who followed them the majority of them and who reach the time of trials and tribulations in belief declared them to be out the fold of Islam. And they were not from those deviant sects that were ascribed to Islam, meaning they were outside the fold of Islam. And that they were kuffar. And that is a confirmation of the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim that he put in his book called Al-Nuniya. As I said this Poetry before. وَلَقَدْ تَقَلَّدَ كُفْرَهُمْ خَمْسُونَ فِي عَشْرٍ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ فِي الْبُلْدَانِ أَلَّا لَكَائِ حَكَاهُ عَنْهُمُ بَلْ حَكَاهُ قَبْلَهُ الطَّبْرَانِ He said this poetry in Nunia. He said وَلَقَدْ تَقَلَّدَ كُفْرَهُمْ خَمْسُونَ فِي عَشْرٍ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ فِي الْبُلْدَانِ He says indeed who have followed the kufr of the Jahmiyyah are 50 times 10 from the ulama of the buldan, meaning those scholars that were widespread, which is multiplied by 50 times 10, which equals how many, everyone? 500. Scholars from the ulama al amsar who deem and believe that the what? That the jahmiyyah were considered kuffar. That was the majority of the people of the salaf were upon. However, you'll find from the A'imma of today, which is the great Imam Hamilul Liwa'i Jarh al-Ta'adil Bihaq, 
Imam Rabi ibn Hadi Madkhali mentioned in his book entitled Aqidah Tassalaf wa Ashab al Hadith, where he brought a statement talked about the Jahmiyyah. In the book called Aqidah Tassalaf wa Ashab al Hadith by the great Imam Abu Uthman Ismail ibn Abdurrahman al Naysabuni al Sabuni al Naysabuni, Rahimallah. Shaykh Rabi mentioned and said about the Jahmiyyah. He said, You'll find that the, the Salaf, especially Imam Ahmed, made takfir of what? Of course, of course, of the heads of the Jahmiyyah. Whereas you'll find from them who left off the common folk that were being misguided. Of those who did not believe the, the severe beliefs of the Jahmiyyah. That they were what? They were left off of being or deemed to be out the fold of Islam. But the heads of those, for the callers of them, were deemed to be what? Kuffar. Is it clear, everyone? Whereas from the common folk, he said the a'yan of the jahmiyyah, or the heads of the ru'us, from them. However, in regards to the, the common folk, you'll find that some of the salaf were reluctant in deeming them to be what? Kuffar. Is it clear, everyone? Tayyip. Right. But the point of the matter is you'll find that no doubt that the majority of the Salaf, they deem the Jahmiyyah to be outside the fold of Islam. Deem them to be outside the fold of Islam. Why? Because you'll find that this particular sect from the, from the, from the Muslims, even though they ascribe to Islam, however, they do not deem to be the Book of Allah, the Son of the Messenger of Allah as being a form of usage in regards to evidence. Or be taken as a hujjah. Rather, you'll find that the Jahmiyyah turned away from the Book of Allah and the Son of the Messenger of Allah. So you'll find that this was the reason why they deemed them to be out the fold of Islam. I'll say it again. He says, They went outside the Book of Allah and the Son of the Messenger of Allah. Jamir Tawa'if min al-Khawarij wa Shia wa Qadariyah wa Ghayrihim yuhawilun a yastadillu bil kitab wa sunnah. He says, all of the sects, especially even from the past, from the past, and the Shia of the past, and the Qadiriyya, and other than them, they tried to use the Book of Allah, the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah, as a what? As evidence. Even though it was in a manner that was distorted. Even though it was in a manner that was distorted. However, the Jahmiyyah did not make this type of attempt at all. Rather, they left the Book of Allah, the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah and turned totally away from it, and turned away from what the Messenger of Allah والسلام, brought as proper guidance, so it could be utilized as a form of evidence and proof for the people. And as a result of it, they had bad thoughts concerning the Book of Allah in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, And they had the belief that it doesn't benefit anything. This type of aqidah, no doubt everyone, is kufr, and it's what? And it's apostation of Islam. That's the reason why you'll find that the majority of the ulama al Amsar deem the Jahmiyyah to be what? Kuffar. Is it clear, everyone? Let's keep going. And we'll stop. So let's keep going. Rawa Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Hatim fi kitabin al Radda al Jahmiyyah al Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi. Qa ashab al Jahmi. يريدون أن يقولوا إن نظرس فرز إن الله لم يكلم موسى ولا ويريدون أن يقولوا ليس في السماء شيء وأن الله ليس على العرش أرى أن يستتابوا فإن تابوا وإلا قتلوا وروى عبد الرحمن بن أبي حاتم في كتاب الردع الجهمية عبد الرحمن بن أبي حاتم الإمام His book entitled The Refutation Against the Jahmiyyah upon the same great Imam that we spoke about spoke about a moment ago. We conveyed that statement upon a moment ago. Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, Abu Sa'id al Anbali, the great Imam. قال, the people of Jahm, they want to say, now listen to this. Indeed, Allah did not speak to Musa. Indeed, Allah did not speak to Musa. Nor did he take Ibrahim as a Khalil. And they want to say that there's nothing in the heavens. And that Allah is not above the throne. 
He says, I see that repentance is sought from them. And if they make repentance, proper repentance, and that affair will be, alhamdulillah, or accept, and if it reaches the ruler, then he is what? Killed. So you find that the, the affairs of the Jahmiyyah just did not stop where everyone, it just did not stop with affairs of negating Allah, Tabarik wa Ta'ala, and His name and His attributes until they start, started to make these type of statements of atheism, such as Allah not being above, nor under the throne, or above the throne to the end of it. You'll find that the misguidance crept in other affairs to the point they started negating that Allah spoke to Musa. So Allah did not speak to Musa. Not even the Jews and the Christians believe this nonsense. You'll find from the Jews they believe that Allah spoke to Musa. Or Allah, uh, Musa, excuse me, Allah spoke to Musa. And likewise, vice versa, Musa spoke to Allah to pray with that. And you'll find that they believe this. And you'll find that they believe that Ibrahim, that Allah took him as a Khalil, as a what? As an intimate friend. You'll find that the Salaf upon these affairs during their time were very severe and stern against these type of corrupt beliefs. To the point where the ruler, if it reached him and from them, was, was, the, was the Khalifa at the time, what had taken place with the Abdullah al Qasi. Where Ja'at ibn Hidirham, that this type of belief that Allah did not speak to Musa, and that Allah ta'ala, did not take Ibrahim as a Khalil, and that Allah not being of the throne above the Arsh, was from the belief of the Shaykh of Jahl ibn Safwan, who is Ja'at ibn Dirham. Ja'at ibn Dirham. Ja'at ibn Dirham was the first one to say that Allah did not speak to Musa. And that Allah did not take Ibrahim as a, as a close and intimate friend. You'll find that Abdullah al Qasri. These type of beliefs, when they became widespread, the Khalifa was very stern against him until he was brought on the day of the Eid. And as we know, the statement in which Ibn al Qayyim mentioned in his Nuniyah, as Ibn al Qayyim says, it's not Abdullah Qasri. I just remember the poetry. It's in poetry. So the individual who slaughtered Ja'ad ibn Dirham was named Khalid al Qasri. I'll say the poetry again. Said in his poetry. Beautiful poetry about the great Imam al Qayyim in Nuniya. Where he said, Indeed, Ja'ad was slaughtered by Khadid al Qasri on the day of the Eid, Eid al Adha. So you'll find that Khadid al Qasri brought Ja'ad al Dirham. So this is how the Salaf are. These are true men that didn't tolerate nonsense in Aqida. They said, they said Slaughter them, all of you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your sacrifice of what you put forth today. However, today, what am I doing? Listen to what he said. Today I'm slaughtering Ja'ad al Dirham. That's my slaughter, my sacrifice today. For verily, he claimed that, Ibrah, that Allah did not take Ibrahim as a Khalil, nor did he speak to Musa at all. And he, and he descended. And then he what? Slaughtered him. Ja'ad ibn Dirham. 
slaughtered him for Allah Taala. Now listen to what Ibn Al Qayyim said about this this type of slaughter and sacrifice. Listen to the end of what Ibn Al Qayyim says at the end of the statement. Listen. شكر الله ضحية كل صاحب سنة لله دركا من أخي قرباني. This is to this type of sternness, how praiseworthy it was to the point where Ibn Al-Qayyim said at the end of the poetry, Allah, may Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, shakar Allahu dahiyyata kulli sahibi sunnatin. Allah is what? Was happy the act of a sacrifice of every sahibi sunnah, of a person of the truth and the haq. Until he prays about saying, Lillahi darruka min akhi qurbani. This type of sternness, upon this individual by keeping the people as a'qeeda protected from his guidance and as a fact of what? In order to preserve the Muslim's creed, in order for it to remain pure and intact and that they would not be affected by the cause of the devil. So the people could die in the state of it and there would be for their reason for their demise and their hereafter or it could be a reason for them or their hereafter being jeopardized and as a result of them embracing these type of adulterated, perverted, disgusting, corrupt Beliefs. Is it clear, everyone? Now, if you was to bring this type of man today, I don't think anybody would praise you. Everybody would be like, you, you're the genuine. You're crazy. You've lost your mind. What kind of sternness is this? What is this? Actually, we're not in the times of old anymore. Those are back then. To the end of it, to the nonsense. Sternness upon the people of Bid'ah today is considered a method of madamma. A dispraiseworthy fact. But higher stand sternness upon the people of innovations in the past was what? That was a manqaba. That was something that a person stood out for. It was praised for. And like I said, everyone, what happened to the great Imam Abu Muhammad, Abu Muhammad, Al Hasan ibn Ali ibn Khalaf al Barbahadi, the great Imam, who died 329 after the Hijrah was known for that type of what? Sternness. In his book called Shah Sunnah. Do you know that they say when he died, Rahim Allah, the only one that prayed over him was one man. He died in his sister's house. They, it was a man and a woman present. That was it. And I think it was his sister. But his sister couldn't pray over him. So the only person that could pray over him was what? It was one man. So she told his khadim, the servant, servant, pray over him. Because she couldn't pray over him. She's a woman. Right, everyone? So, they said, what was his, he was known for being stern against the people of innovation, right? Nerf was known for that. Is it clear, is everyone with me? He was known for this type of creed and belief. He was known for what we're talking about now. And being stern upon these people and those who oppose Allah's proper guidance, right? What happened to, to, to this great Imam, Abu Muhammad al Hassan ibn Ali ibn Khalaf al Barbahad? They said when he died, they said people with white thobes came out of nowhere, filling up the place, praying over him. Who do you think those people were? Huh? The angels. They said we seen people out of nowhere. It's coming. There's no nowhere, no one in sight. Couldn't find anyone. No one in sight. Out of nowhere. They said people with white garments were praying over him. In the form of men, of course. In the form of men, very white. White garments and what have you, out of nowhere, just started coming and prayed over him. As a war, as a what, everyone? As a form of a kalama, as a form of honor for, for this Greek Imam. In order for what? To show the sternness upon the people and or falsehood in his people and those who call to the, to the filth of the bliss of the devil, this is what their final outcome would be. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and you from them. But this is what the people of Sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them as a form of honor for them. Especially at the time of their death. And the great Imam was tested in a very great way to the point where the Khalifa during this time was the one that was looking to kill him. That's the reason why he had to go into hiding. And that's the only reason why he was what? He died where only one man prayed over him. You see clear, everyone? Beautiful history. Fine, we'll stop here. Great Imam, Sahib Shah Sunnah, Sunnah al Barbahadi.
صحبة الصلاة البابا هذه بكوي إمام أبو محمد الحسن بن الحسن بن علي بن خلف البربهاني the one who died 329 after the Hijrah. Is it clear, everyone? 329, great Imam. The great Imam of the Sunnah. He was tested by the the Khilafah or the people of the Khilafah. Look to how Allah raised his status. This is how great Allah raised his status so the people loved him. That the people loved him to the point where he was given an exhortation. He was given an exhortation one time and reminded the people of, of Allah. And within his exhortation of him reminding and addressing the people, he sneezed. Rahimallah. He sneezed. The people shammatu. He said, he said, Alhamdulillah. The people said, Ya Rahimakallah. That's Tashmeet al Altas. So we know, Alti the Altas. He said, Alhamdulillah, people made Tashmeet. Tashmeet al Altas, what he said, Ya Rahimakallah. The whole people said, Ya Rahimakallah. Then the people outside in the neighborhood heard the people in the masjid say, Ya Rahimakallah, until they said it. And then the people outside that said it, the people in the neighborhood heard them say it, so they said it. So the point to the point where it, this budja, this noise of this Tashmeet, reached the khilaf, the debate of the house of the Muslim ruler. Until everyone said Ya Rahimakallah until it got back to the what to the ruler, and then the ruler was said, Who is this man that they say Ya Rahimakallah to? And that is where fitna started, where the people who hated this great Imam started to utilize and capitalize this in order to cause fitna and fill the heart of the ruler of, of, of envy and hatred and jealousy until the point where he became what? An outcast. But these are from the reasons of why. They became so jealous and envious of them because of these type of what affairs that take place from them is this type of manqaba, this, this great matter that had taken place during his time where he sneezed and the whole neighborhood said, Ya Rahimakallah, until it reached the ruler. And the ruler was like, who is this man? Who's the whole man that the whole area, the whole city was saying, Ya Rahimakallah to? You see, it clear everyone? So that was one of the reasons. It was two occasions where he, there was two uh, khalifas where he was being chased by the ruler. But that was one of the occasions. We'll stop here, inshallah. I'm sorry for the uh, long detail, but that's it. We'll stop for today. I'm sorry, everyone, for being wrong with it. Is it any, questions, any questions about the lesson? Huh? About the lesson. Tafadda. He studied from the students of Imam Ahmed, not Imam Ahmed. Oh, oh, like Abu Bakr al-Marudhi, the great Imam, Sahib al-Imam Ahmed. That was from the students. And also Sahib ibn Abdullah Tustari. Sahib ibn Abdullah Tustari. And Abu Bakr al-Marudhi. Abu Bakr al-Marudhi, everyone knows Abu Bakr al-Marudhi from the great Talamidh and Ashab al-Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah. You know from his students, his students was the great Imam Ibn Batta al Ukbari. <laughs> the great Imam, Sahib al Iban, Kubra al Sura. <coughs> Any other questions about the last anyone? Let me stop here, inshallah. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdak. وشهدوا أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك